please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. I'm here today to speak about uh, with Dr. Sai uh, Partha Sarathi from uh, the University of Arizona to talk about COVID and sleep apnea, uh, the connections between the two. Sleep apnea as a COVID risk predictor. I'm uh, going to introduce Dr. Sai. You are both a sleep and sleep disorder specialist, as well as a pulmonary critical care specialist at the University of Arizona in Tucson. How does this combination help you understand the connection between sleep apnea and COVID outcomes? Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Jill. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, uh, yes, um, being both a sleep specialist as well as a uh, pulmonary critical care physician allows me to uh, see patients uh, in the clinical workflow, both in the ICU as well as in the sleep center, as well as I get calls from patients who are at home um, who end up uh, either contracting COVID infection or they end up uh, in the hospital in the ICU where they are not on a ventilator and this gives me a unique perspective because I do see when I'm in the ICU, uh, there are patients who are under my care who have a history of obstructive sleep apnea and uh, they need to get a CPAP therapy device. And that brings in a lot of complexity uh, to their care because of the aerosolization potential of CPAP and BiPAP. Um, similarly, uh, patients at home with sleep apnea, they end up calling me uh, because they end up getting COVID infection that's not severe enough for them to get up, get into the hospital yet. Uh, but then we talk about ways of mitigating the spread of COVID infection in the home, as well as for them to be adherent to their therapy so that they can reduce the complications due to the COVID infection uh, that may potentially end up putting them in the hospital and on a ventilator. So uh, it gives me, uh, it helps me contextualize them in various environments, in the home, in the hospital, outside of the ICU and in the ICU, and how the various care delivery is administered and or the barriers or the facilitators for better care delivery uh, in these folks. And so that gives me a unique perspective. Um, subjectively, I can see that um, my patients seem to be at a greater risk, uh, as some of the evidence literature is also suggesting that it is, it is indeed the case. Do we have any idea why having sleep apnea puts people uh, more at risk for severe COVID reactions? Absolutely, and I think this would be a good time to share some slides uh, if I can um, you know, put them up there. So essentially, what is uh, sleep apnea? Uh, if we put up the first slide, you can see that uh, this is the uh, cross-section of the uh, what the throat looks like. Uh, the part of the throat that's behind the soft palate is called nasopharynx. The part that's behind the tongue is called the oropharynx. And then the part that's below the tongue and right about the um, epiglottis, uh, you know, uh, is where the hypopharynx is. The obstruction uh, uh, to uh, this passageway can manifest as obstructive sleep apnea. The soft palate can actually vibrate and rub against the back of the throat in the nasopharyngeal area, which is a very common area for the obstruction. And that is what creates the snoring noise. And so if you go to the next slide, um, uh, you know, this is what we are finding is, is that you know, people having sleep apnea means that they're going to have low oxygen count because when they're obstructive breathing, as I showed in the previous slide, there's less air going into the lungs. That means there's less oxygen. And moreover, sleep apnea is associated with the other comorbidities which have been known to be associated with COVID uh, infections, such as obesity, uh, high blood pressure, and diabetes mellitus. All of those three variables are independently associated with sleep apnea. So now combined with sleep apnea-related low oxygen count, you have these other comorbidities which also coexist with sleep apnea, and they are also putting this, these patients at risk. So it's no wonder that these patients are at greater risk of developing COVID infection. Now, what happens is that when they're sleeping, uh, when they have low oxygen count due to the sleep apnea, that further aggravates 
the low oxygen count due to a COVID infection. And what is more is that with COVID infection, there's leaky capillaries. When the infection sets in, just like how we have a head cold, we have a runny nose, and we bring a phlegm uh, from you know the back of the throat. Similarly, when there's infection in the lung, it makes fluid that pours into the lungs. Now, when someone has untreated sleep apnea and they're sucking against a closed upper airway, as I showed in the previous slide, you're essentially creating negative pressure inside the chest. And that negative pressure allows for the liquid and fluid in our bloodstream to pour more easily into the lungs and drown the lungs. So I, we think that that's one of the reasons, not only the low oxygen count due to sleep apnea, but also the low oxygen count is uh, uh, due to the fact that there is a negative pressure where we are trying to suck air in against a closed throat that creates a negative pressure that actually sucks fluid into the lungs and it can hasten the deterioration of their sleep apnea. So that is why data research is suggesting that there's an increased risk for hospitalization due to COVID-19 in patients with sleep apnea. There's an increased risk for death in patients with sleep apnea, as well as uh, you know there are studies showing that people with uh, high body weight uh, and not their blood sugar control is associated with increased risk for death in the first seven days after getting hospitalized uh, uh, in an ICU. So. This is the reason why sleep apnea and COVID-19 is a bad combination. May I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, should we make a difference between people who have treated sleep apnea and, uh, and untreated sleep apnea? Are the risks different? It, you know, that's a great question. And <clears throat> there is literature that is trying to look at that. We don't have large enough data sets to be able to clearly determine that. But if I were to hypothesize, I would say, yeah, if someone is adherent with their CPAP treatment, they probably are reducing the risks. Why? Uh, because they're reducing the negative pressure generation inside the lungs, less amount of fluid pouring in. And even if they have um, you know, a, a, a COVID-related infection, they probably are less likely to deteriorate. I think in the early stages, CPAP and BiPAP are protective before they contract the infection, if they're using it, it's protective. The second reason why it may be protective is, is that we know the sleep and the immune system are closely tied. So if someone you know, is able to um, get good sleep, the immune system is more robust. So maybe they, even if they were exposed to the virus, they beat up the virus and don't develop a COVID disease because they end up having asymptomatic or relatively less symptomatic infection because they've been getting good sleep and the immune system is more robust. So there are various reasons why we would hypothesize that, but there is no clear data to confirm it. Uh, a follow-up question. I follow the conversation in a very large Facebook group for long haulers, long COVID people, and there are a growing number of uh, threads about people being diagnosed with sleep apnea. So do we know if one of the result of being long COVID may be developing sleep apnea, or is it just that people had sleep apnea, but they were not diagnosed before, and it shows up more after they get COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the, the right answer. I would suggest it's the latter, uh, that they already had sleep apnea before all of this happened, um, but it was just not diagnosed. Now they're getting more medical attention after their hospitalization, yeah. and so they're more likely to get uh, diagnosed. I don't see how COVID per se would increase the risk for developing uh, the infection. Yeah, it's a good uh, time to remind people that uh, probably 70 to 80 percent of people with sleep apnea are undiagnosed and that really a big effort should be made to change that. Yeah, and it's also true that people, even before COVID, if someone had a heart attack and came into the hospital, they're more likely to get a diagnosis of sleep apnea. So when you look at patterns of healthcare utilization, the time of sleep apnea diagnosis usually happens at the time when they recently sought medical attention for some of the problem. There are other people who de novo end up getting diagnosed uh, with sleep apnea as well. But if you took all comers, there is usually a spike when there's some other medical problem that's happened that requires surgery or coming to the hospital for a pneumonia or a heart attack or things of the nature, that's when there's more medical attention and a greater likelihood of a sleep apnea diagnosis. And that may be the phenomenon that you're seeing with the long haulers. Um, I'm sorry I took uh, this presentation on a tangent. <laughs> we probably should get back to it. 
Um, very appropriate um, segue. Uh, so if we actually show uh, the the next slide, and some of them actually has um, you know discussions about you know other forms of treatment as well. So this is essentially for dental sleep medicine. If people are having mandible advancement device. One of the things that they should be doing well, a dentist who does mandible advancement device is actually at increased risk because they're staring into someone's uh, you know mouth and working on their oral cavity. And that puts them at high risk for aerosol generation. So uh, how has this affected our dental sleep clinic? We have a dental sleep clinic besides a medical sleep clinic in our sleep center. And uh, there we are doing RT-PCR testing three days before they come to the appointment. We're asking the CDC questions on the day off and doing temperature screening. We have negative pressure rooms and uh, both the patient and uh, the provider as well as the dental assistant wear a PPE mask. And this was published by one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Imran Patel in the Journal of Dental Sleep Medicine. Um, and if you go to the ne and next slide, um, uh, you know, this talks about what you were referring to, you know, if it's using CPAP and BiPAP at home, what are the pros and what are the cons? So we talked about the pros, about how it may help the immune system, with better sleep, it'll help improve the oxygenation, it reduces the ill effects of obstructive sleep apnea that includes the negative pressure effects, but it also protects against the usual risk of cardiovascular events and uh, it does so, especially at a time of high level of inflammation. Patients with COVID, what we're seeing is that they have a high amount of inflammation in their body. Uh, and we can also see that measured as CRP levels that every COVID patient gets when they admit, get admitted to the hospital. We're finding very high levels of inflammation or C-reactive protein levels. And so we know that the high level of inflammation causes breakage of plaques that they may have formed uh, in their coronary arteries. So, these patients are also at increased risk for cardiovascular events. And from time to time, we have some people having heart attacks or inflammation of the heart or inflammation of the lining of the heart. And so that's why using CPAP and BiPAP at home would be beneficial, even if they have a relatively minor infection, it can help that. But what are the cons? It can actually cause aerosol. It can spread the infection to other family members. So that's why the Society um, American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends that if they're using the CPAP or BiPAP, they should continue to use it, but try to isolate themselves from their bed partner and other members of the family or as yet COVID negative. Uh, in late stages, um, uh, with COVID infection, we think that there are uh, microthrombi or small clots that are forming in their lungs. In that situation, their lung, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the blood vessels in the lung, the blood pressure there is very high. And um, when that is high, um, you're applying pressure on that. And that can actually make the pulmonary artery pressures or the blood vessels in the lungs, blood pressure actually be even higher. So although CPAP BiPAP may be a good approach in the home setting, if someone were uh, more advanced and they're hospitalized, or even at home, if they're a little bit more advanced, uh, the CPAP BiPAP may not be helping, it may actually be hurting. And we really think that at the home it's okay, but in the hospital, things may actually flip-flop. It may actually hurt rather than help. And the other thing is it could delay medical attention. So someone with a borderline low oxygen count normally would come and seek medical attention, but they're using a CPAP or BiPAP at home. They're less likely to see more prompt, seek more prompt attention and therefore less likely to get medications uh, such as uh, uh, you know, remdesivir in a hospitalized setting, which is an antiviral, or even get um, monoclonal antibodies, uh, which just as of the day before yesterday was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you give monoclonal antibodies, uh, there are, you know, two different uh, antibodies that from two different companies, the Regeneron as well as the Lilly uh, antibody, uh, if it's given within seven or 10 days um, uh, of symptom onset, it can actually reduce the risk for getting hospitalized. And mm -hmm. so if someone is using CPAP, BiPAP, they may be less likely to go get those antibodies, but then we need to do research to show that CPAP, BiPAP use at home can actually prevent them from getting hospitalized. And that research is actually commencing. Um, you know, uh, We are um, working with uh, Mount Sinai uh, to actually do a two-center study. This is actually a study of Dr. Naomi Shaw in Mount Sinai, and we are just a recruitment site for her study. And uh, we're trying to see if <clears throat> Even patients without sleep apnea, if they are symptomatic, having borderline oxygen count, if they were put on CPAP or BiPAP at the home, can we reduce the risk of getting hospitalized? 
Is this part of uh, the research you're conducting in Arizona? Yeah, this is part of many uh, uh, research studies that we're conducting. We are also doing a study uh, that we are partnering uh, with uh, uh, Regeneron, uh, where we're giving antibodies for household contacts of patients with known COVID. So these household contacts are actually COVID negative, but they be, they are have been living with a COVID positive patient, but they, you try to give them instead of the vaccine because of the shortage of vaccine and such, we're giving them uh, these antibodies so that you know it gives them 30 days worth of immunity, just like uh, a vaccine does, but it doesn't last past 30 days. But the idea there is is that it you know kills off the virus even if it had been exposed to and aborts the and reduces the risk of developing COVID disease that would actually put them in the hospital. So we are doing that study. We are also doing a study called the SEAL Initiative, which is a community engaged alliance for combating uh, COVID infection, which is specifically targeted towards minority populations, um, African Americans, Hispanics, and uh, Native Americans uh, to address issues about how they can prevent COVID, to educate them about how to prevent COVID, find out what practices they're doing, what are their current needs uh, that they have? Do they have enough masks? Do they have enough soap and uh, disinfectant uh, in their uh, homes? As well as address uh, trust and mistrust issues with the healthcare system, because that seems to be a barrier for some of them going and getting vaccine. So the issue about vaccine hesitancy, vaccine uptake, vaccine adoption, and we are trying to do an educational intervention to promote that in those particular communities, which actually are at greater risk. Again, being in the ICU gave me perspective to actually apply to the NIH for that particular grant. And it's actually an Arizona statewide initiative. We're partnering, partnering with three other institutions and we are leading that initiative in the state of Arizona, which is part of 11 state alliance. The reason why we put that grant in to be one of those 11 states is because not only did NIH identify that these 11 states are lagging behind uh, in terms of their ability to protect the minority communities, but also when I'm working in the ICU, when I look at my list of 14 patients in my ICU, the day that I learned back in, gosh, April, that you know these communities are at increased risk when CDC released their data showing that minority communities are disproportionately affected. I look at my patient list of my 14 patients under my care, and 12 out of the 14 patients were either Hispanics or African Americans or Native Americans. The uh, the Native American communities have been particularly uh, hit hard, right? Yes, um, and the Hispanic community in, in sure. the Southwest, and it's very there's not as much of uh, African American community in Arizona, um, but both these communities are getting uh, a disproportionate share, unfortunately, of not just COVID-related infections, but also hospitalizations and deaths. Yeah. As you know, uh, we have produced uh, our roadmap for the future of uh, the association, what we're going to get involved, and one of the eight unmet needs, the last one, which is overarching all the others, is about health disparities. and. Uh, and COVID has been just a terrible thing that has demonstrated how serious this issue of health disparities is among all minorities. Absolutely. And along those lines, we are doing a research uh, study where uh, we are looking at uh, the entire Banner healthcare system. We have 29 hospitals in the system in the Southwest United States and over you know, 25,000 hospitalizations in just the state of Arizona we are finding a disproportionate share of burden of disease, hospitalizations, and death in the Hispanic and Native American community. And that's part of the reason why we are encouraging them to participate in research studies, because some of the vaccine studies don't have enough African-Americans represented in the study. Um, and they don't have enough Hispanics represented in the study. And that's part of the SEAL initiative is to promote that. And so one way that people can actually help improve their participation is by going and registering in the COVPN registry, um, which is the Coronavirus Prevention Network um, uh, dot org or Coronavirus Prevention Network dot org, and there is a COVPN registry. If they register there, which is a very confidential, secure registry, uh, if they need a Hispanic or African American or a Native American in various states to participate in future therapeutics or future vaccine studies that are new vaccines are coming to the market, which are more stable and hopefully as effective that need to be studied. Uh, and that way they can actually reach out to these individuals who have expressed an interest in participating in research studies. And so that's one of the jobs that we are doing in the SEAL grant, which is funded by the NIH, 
um, during an emergency pandemic is to encourage these people to register in the COVPN registry. So anybody who Googles a COVPN registry can actually go to the website and register. It's very easy to register. You, thank you. You just provided me the perfect segue to my next question. Uh, we have received many questions from patients about how they are, they can find how their state is administering uh, vaccines and how they can get info on receiving it. Can you tell us anything about it? Yeah. Um, so as you know, there's um, I mean, a change in the administration and there are lots of complexity uh, with the vaccine rollout. And uh, there are some issues about vaccine related shortages that had not been anticipated um, until very recently. Um, so one of the main outlets of the release of vaccines are the local hospitals that are identified as pods. Um, and these pods are being activated sequentially depending upon what stage of the vaccine rollout they are in. I do think that the 1A1 involved, say, IC physicians, of which I was a part of. So we were early in receiving the vaccine, but now it's gone up to 1B and soon to 1C. And when that happens, they're also rolling it out. Each state's health department is the one that's sort of controlling it. And so they can people can go to their state website, health department website um, and actually look at where these pods exist for their particular state. So if they just Google state health department of Arizona, they go to the Arizona Department of Health or AZDHS. And when they go there, it'll tell them where the sites, delivery sites are, uh, what the priority is, and they can also register through the web link. They just click on it, give their name and their date of birth, phone number and email address, and it'll ask them questions saying, do you have diabetes? Are you overweight? Are you over the age of 75? So if you're over the age of 75, uh, you qualify right now because that's the phase we are in. But of course, this keeps changing day by day, especially depending upon the availability of the vaccine. Now, they're also giving it to universities besides the state health department. Our university, the University of Arizona, was just activated as a pod last week, where we are in the business of vaccinating teachers, both in the university as well as K through 12 teachers, and people are give caregivers in nursing facilities and such. And so um, we are vaccinating that group, and that's been given to the universities. But the state department, uh, health department, is still vaccinating the people over the age of 75. And so all they have to do is bring their driver's license or some form of ID that shows their date of birth. They don't need an insurance card or anything like that. Uh, they don't need even insurance. So they just go to these sites, but they need to be able to navigate the website, which is one of the reasons why the SEAL initiative is getting into it, because it's the first time it was rolled out, there were some glitches in this website. Just like how Obamacare was rolled out and healthcare.gov had issues with the rollout, similarly, some of these websites have glitches. Uh, and it's kind of complicated. What if someone doesn't have internet? What if someone has internet but has this difficulty reading these little small letters because they are uh, elderly? Or what if they have some literacy issues? So we think that this web-based registering mechanism uh, actually is, again, um, unintendedly, uh, it has unintentional consequences of aggravating health disparities, of not make it, uh, making it as easy and available to the people who are actually yeah. in need. I, I have to say something. So um, I am just over 65 and the state of Florida changed, uh, was the first one, I think, to say anybody over 65 should receive the vaccine. And because I'm informed, I, uh, I didn't get the information through the state website. I got it through the regular press, which had a link to, in Miami, there are two places where you can get the vaccine. One, uh, a hospital for people over 75, and the other one, a health system for people 65 and over. And so I just decided to go to check every 30 minutes the registration site. Uh, the first day, they were the site was saying that they were getting ready to be active. And then I was unaware, but they said to the press and to on radio that they were going to open at 11 o'clock in the morning. And because I was not paying attention, I woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning, I checked at 8, I checked at 8.30, and I checked at 9 o'clock, and they opened their website at 9. And so I was one of the first to register, and I was vaccinated an hour and a half later. Uh, I went to the place that was closest to where I live, 
which is a hospital in a uh, mostly black neighborhood. I, when I say mostly, it's probably 90% black. And during my 30 minutes in the hospital, I saw one black person getting vaccinated because of the digital disparities that have this really dark influence on health disparities. It was really shocking. And I learned three days ago that the, uh, the CEO of that health system said that less than 3% of the people vaccinated uh, are black and Latinos and that they are going to change completely the way it's being done because they need to fix this situation. That's too bad. Yep, absolutely. And of course, uh, the system, even though they announced that they were opening the system at 11 o'clock, I went at nine o'clock and at 9.30, the system was closed because 16,000 people had registered and they had no longer any material available for the others. Hmm. Which I think is a natural uh, issue that hopefully this new administration is going to resolve. Yes, uh, so we really need to ramp up uh, production and uh, it'll be more effective with the distribution and both FEMA and, uh, and the National Guard need to be invoked uh, because this is a national disaster. Uh, there's so many lives, 400,000 lives that have been lost in a month. There's going to be a half a million people who are going to die. Sure. And yeah. so I, if this is not a national emergency that requires the activation of FEMA and, their national, and, and the National Guard, I don't know what is. So it needs to be treated as such. And we need to bring in those resources where we can literally add prop tents using the Air National Guard in all sort of cities and uh, townships and villages and start uh, vaccinating you know, people. But we need a robust supply chain, as you're well aware, in order to be able to do that. But one of the things that was brought up amongst our SEAL Alliance is that while we are lamenting about the mal lack of proper distribution and effective vaccination campaign in the US, when you look at globally, there's global health disparities where at least, you know, for example, I'm told that Canada has purchased five times the amount of vaccine needed to vaccinate Canadians. Whereas you have uh, countries like Kenya that just don't have any vaccine that's been available for them. Um, and so there's a, and, 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 and actually in Israel, 40% of the population has already been vaccinated. And yes. so, um, so when we, when we look at that, there is a global uh, disparity, health disparity that's emerging. And so we need to be not just a, a good citizen of the United States, but it is true there are more deaths happening in the U.S. than anywhere else. And so there may be justification for, you know, uh, you know, sort of tilting that uh, scale uh, towards the U.S., but there also needs to be more conscientious and more proper behavior management of doing lockdown and state uh, governments need to actually enforce mandatory mask wearing and not just the federal government in order to really identify and, and embrace this as an issue that's happening and not a figment of the imagination of the press. Yeah, well, you're saying that Israel, which is like the leader in the world in the percentage of its population vaccinated, uh, it's now, as you said, 40%, but it's also in a full third lockdown. And I mean, and sure, some of the ultra orthodox are complaining like they always complain because they don't like the state. It's OK. But the vast majority of people uh, just follow the rules. Everybody understand that this is not done to uh, to take away your civil rights, but to make sure that this is a society that can come out of it as fast as possible and function normally as fast as possible. I never understood what is the issue in this country where it's pretty obvious that Yes, you're going to suffer for three months. And then after that, we can get back to a much more normal life. Yeah, and I think there needs to be a, a, some proper scientific analysis of what is the true impact on, on the businesses? What's the true impact on the economy? Why is it that the stock market is still doing fine? Why is it that the housing market is booming? Uh, why is it that all of that is happening despite the pandemic? And why is it that a neighboring state like uh, Colorado that has more stricter um, lockdown requirements still has a pretty robust economy compared to Arizona, which has not instituted those lockdowns? Um, so in other words, there is no tangible scientific evidence saying that the lockdown damaged the economy of Colorado. 
And we're not doing that here, but Arizona is actually number one in the country and number one in the world, therefore, of uh, new COVID uh, infections and COVID-related hospitalizations and death. And so I, I really worry that it is essentially lobbyists for certain uh, sectors of businesses uh, like the you know restaurant industry or or the you know shopping industry that are lobbying for that and that's leading to more disproportionate amount of infections and death but it's really not impacting overall the business environment as much it's just affecting the businesses of those sectors of the business that depend on people milling around in a particular area and visiting restaurants and shopping centers or cinema. Well, at the same time, guaranteeing the uh, the uh, the gravity of the public health issue that it generates, yes. which is, I mean, the lack of investment in public health in this country, I think, has been uh, like a an important uh, component in having people not understand at all that public health is fundamental for having a society that functions properly. Yeah, and, and I think while you know, we are at it, I, I really think there is something to talk about, you know, health literacy, right? And, and so it's not only, there is a lot of investment in public health uh, outreach and efforts, but it also, there are two, it takes two to tango. Uh, you need to have a prepared mind of the recipient of the public health information for them to be able to adopt that. And for that, we need a, a we need to guarantee a basic level of education. And for that, education needs to be cheaper. If we make education, um, you know, more and more expensive, and we make it difficult for people to be able to pay their way through college, because colleges are getting more and more expensive. And the basic education, we don't let you know uh, mint enough basic education into their curriculum, but we make it expensive, and we make public schools uh, unavailable. Uh, as opposed to charter and you know private schools, then that's going to uh, to prevent a particular society to ever have that upward mobility. But it's also going to prevent them from being having a prepared mind to receive these public health information and know where to get good health information from and be discerning of the source of this information so that they don't go with certain sources that are spreading misinformation and mistrust um, uh, in into the society. Then. Uh, if that were to happen, part of the blame also lies in how we make education more and more expensive in the U.S. Yeah. yeah, all those questions are fundamental because there is an agreement among the scientific community that this pandemic is not the last one we're going to experience. And, and, we were, uh, and we better be ready for the next one. Yeah, and we were worried about the new variants, uh, the California and the South African variant. Uh, and of course, uh, the South African variant is in the UK, uh, but there is a California 20 variant, uh, which is probably responsible for a lot of the deaths in Southern California. And here in Arizona, we don't, haven't seen that particular variant, uh, but we're worried that if it were to jump over into Arizona with our state laws not being supportive um, uh, for lockdown, uh, it'll spread like fire. Very sorry to hear. Uh, I know we could talk about this topic for hours, but uh, we have to uh, we have to come to an end in this conversation. I just have one more question for you. Uh, what steps should sleep apnea patients take after hearing they are at higher risk for COVID complications? Well, uh, there are two things I, I want to share. One, I'm going to share uh, the last slide uh, that I've been shown so far. Uh, they have to reach out for a good source of medical information for how they can promote their ability to wear their CPAP regularly and uh, treat their sleep apnea. And as part of that, the American Sleep Apnea Association is uh, partnering uh, with us at the University of Arizona, funded by PCORI in this Awake Together Living with Sleep Apnea campaign of the Peer Mentor Program. And this is uh, meant to not only train patients with sleep apnea to be a peer mentor to help other patients, as well as um, uh, for these mentors to help patients who are having difficulty using their CPAP so that they can use their CPAP regularly and reduce the risk for contracting uh, infection and suffering from morbidity. The second thing I would suggest um, uh, that patients do is, is that they learn about where their vaccine sources are. And I myself had the vaccine, you had the vaccine, we're healing, healthy, and alive, and immunized. 
And so they should not have any unfound fears. They should not listen to uh, sources of information that they don't trust. You can get vaccinated. It is safe. And you're going to prevent you yourself from getting the infection. So I'd encourage them to go and look at their local state health department website and find sources of where they can actually go get vaccinated. Sure. And it's not going to happen too many times in our life where spending an hour doing something, getting vaccinated is going to I mean, really easily save our life. It's the biggest luxury. There is no amount of money that can replace this. Yes. It saves our lives. Yes. Thank uh, you so much for your time. Thank absolutely. You Thanks for having me. And uh, it's uh, been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. The ASAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.